Well, as you may know or may not know, I am what's known as, <clears throat> excuse me, a word junkie. I am a total word nerd. My, my favorite book in high school was a book by Robin McNeil from the McNeil Lair News Hour called Word Struck. I love words, but particularly old words that never get used anymore. I like to drop old words in modern contexts and, you know, just see what people say. Here's a couple of my favorites. I love the word perchance, perchance. You may remember Hamlet, if perchance to dream, but I just love to go into like a bagel shop and ask them, do you perchance have any salt bagels left? And just sort of see what they say. I, I love the word thither, thither. It's so good, it's an old fashioned word which literally means go away. And you know, you can't say to your wife or your kids, go away. It's, it's just not nice, and you, you might be kicked out of the house yourself. But, but I love the word thither. You can say, um, son, would you mind going thither? It, it just sounds nicer. And then there's the old-fashioned word forsooth. Forsooth. It, it means totally, or absolutely, or indeed. I love forsooth. You could use it the next time someone says, you know, the 49ers are doing so much better in the second half of the season. And you could say, forsooth, and wonder what they would react to. Here's the word I want to teach you today. I believe this word will change your life. It will give you more hope. And the word is, nevertheless. Would you say that with me in the church plaza? Nevertheless. Would you please say that with me in Sterling Court and in Truesdale? Nevertheless. Would you say that with me, classic worship service and modern worship service? Nevertheless. Nevertheless basically means in spite of that. Or it can mean all the same. Or it can mean that being said. But the word nevertheless is a game changer in the way it affects our heart and the way we relate to the things outside. Let me give you some examples. Let's do some experiments. Now here's the key about nevertheless. It always has to be followed by a reality that is tough. The word nevertheless has to be preceded by a word that is tough, a thought, and, and nevertheless always has to have after it a positive thing. So here, let's try some things. Let's start with a tough reality. Just this week, our country passed the 270,000 mark in people who have died this year of COVID. Now let's say the word together. Nevertheless, next year, we will be in a better place and things are getting better. Now notice you can't say the second thing unless you have that bridge word, nevertheless. Let's try another one. Thanksgiving. This year's Thanksgiving was just not as fun as it could have been. Help me out. Nevertheless, next year's Thanksgiving will be much better because of the vaccine, which has just come out. Here, let's just try one more, but I can tell just watching you, even through this big jumbotron screen, that you are feeling more hopeful at this moment. Here's, here's the last one. Sitting in a cold church parking lot and watching a message at 10 a.m. is not our idea of a perfect worship service. Here we go. Nevertheless, it's better than getting a paper cut and pouring lemon juice on it. Right? Don't you feel better? Nevertheless is a key, key word, which is a great way to lead into our text today, which we are reading from the book of Isaiah. You can pick up a Bible like this, or it's right underneath the screen. Now, just to give you some context here, Isaiah is writing on behalf of the entire country of Judah, and he is writing on behalf of the Israelites, and he is writing on behalf of God in about the year 700 B.C. The Assyrian king, King Shalmaneser V, is either about to invade the people or he has already invaded them. Either way, the Israelites, the people of Judah, are downtrodden. There's a fun old-fashioned word for you. They are beaten down. They are feeling heavy. And this is where Isaiah inserts the word of the morning. 
Now, just to give you some context, the first eight chapters of Isaiah is nothing but heavy, dark reality, which again, remember what we said, in order to have a nevertheless, you have to have a dark reality before it. Here's some of the dark reality of Isaiah. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers. Another one, I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross. There's a good old-fashioned word. Jerusalem staggers, Judah is, fa is falling and is failing. Now here is the word that comes from the morning, and this is our text for the day. Listen for God's word, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. The word, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom. For those who were in distress, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Notice, the nevertheless is helping Isaiah to move to the positive. You have enlarged the nation and increased the joy. The people rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke. You have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Now here is the reason that any Christ follower can move from the hard realities, from the nevertheless beyond. Here is what we have hope in. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne over this kingdom and establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Now again, let's look at the formula for the morning. Isaiah begins with a lot of hard stuff. And then he moves to that word, nevertheless, and then finally, he's able to move to the reason for our hope, and that is a child that is born in a manger. Now, just to give you a little bit of Hebrew, because this is such a great word play for a word nerd like me, the Hebrew word for nevertheless is key. Would you say that with me? See the calf and the yoth? That is key. And key, the key to hope is the word key. And key is sometimes translated as yet or because, but it literally means nevertheless. Now I want to show you throughout the Bible the word key is used. And probably no more powerfully than the New Testament when Jesus is at his low moment. Jesus has lived 33 years and he finds himself at the lowest ebb in his entire life in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there Jesus is on his knees. And the Bible tells us from the book of Matthew this, and this is where the word key even improves Jesus' outlook and his heart. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled then he said to his disciples, this is how sad and, and beaten down Jesus is, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Go a little further. And he fell with his face to the ground. And this is where the word key comes in. And he says to God, my father, if it is possible, make this cup be taken from me. And here is the word key. Yet, or nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And from that moment, Jesus moves from the darkest pain of his life through the key, through the nevertheless, to the cross. Even the cross would have hope and joy 
and Jesus, the rest of his ministry, as he ascends into heaven, it's an upward trajectory. Now, my friends, if this word has the ability to turn God's heart towards hopefulness, what can it do for you and I this Advent and this Christmas? But two thoughts before I sit down, and they are the key to the key to using nevertheless. They are these. You know, nevertheless always needs to be preceded by hard realities. You know, the word nevertheless doesn't work unless you begin with some hard stuff first. In the world-renowned crisis organization AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, we used to have a group that met here before COVID, you know that the whole program that has helped millions of people across the world is founded on the idea that people will bring the hard stuff of their lives into a room. And then there is a nevertheless. And then from that moment on, they're able to move on. I don't know if you ever had a chance to visit an AA meeting, but if they allow you to come in, I encourage you to do so. I had the chance to do so in seminary. I'll never forget, there was a guy there by the name of John, and you could see he'd been sitting in a chair for a long time with the realities of his life. He was so sad. And one day John stood up and John said, Hi, my name is John. And the whole room said, Hi, John. And then John began to trot out the realities of his life. <clears throat> he said, I, I lost my job. My wife left me. I've spent my last dollar. My kids don't talk to me anymore. And I found myself out on a park bench the other night. And I woke up in the morning and there was newspaper on top of me. And I don't know where to go. And then he says the word, and I am an alcoholic. Now, at that moment, the entire room comes around John. In a sense, the room is the great nevertheless. They all come around John and they say, John, you can do this. I have been exactly where you are. You are not going to uh, not make it out of this. We are here with you. The room, the community becomes the nevertheless. And from that moment on, John moves through on the journey post his realities of his life. I don't know if you've noticed, but it feels like most of the media and folks in Washington and at the CDC are speaking to us in new realities that I haven't heard from, from people who are in charge heretofore, another ancient word. But have you heard people say things like, we are not even at the darkest moment of this COVID crisis yet. By February, there could maybe 450 to 500,000 mortalities. People are speaking in tough realities. Now, I personally find this reassuring. I can handle the tough realities, but they need to be real first. Because, as a Christ follower, I know the word, help me out with it now, never the less. And I know that my hope is in the one who came and will always be, that is Christ in a manger. Uh, the great philosopher William Morris once said that, that trouble and turmoil are always the seedbed of hope. It is literally where hope begins. So nevertheless, always has to start with tough realities. Think about yours today. Equally as important, if not more important, the word nevertheless always has to be followed by the promises of Christ. They can't be followed by vague promises or, or sort of positive hallmark promises or neutral promises or pull up your bootstrap promises. No, they have to be the promises of Christ. Over this last couple of months, I've had the opportunity to read and to hear some philosophers from Oxford and Cambridge on the topic of hope. And it was interesting as I was listening to a podcast that I cannot recommend more called In Our Time with Melvin Bragg. They talked to professors of Oxford and Cambridge and all of them had to admit that hope outside of the Christian context 
is a total delusion that you need to have Christ, and again, these are the most secular philosopher professors you could meet, that there is nothing in this world or in ourselves which can give us hope. And they went on to say, you know, you can have hope in yourself, but you know you're going to always let yourself down. You can have hope in the world, but the world will let you down. You can have hope in nature, but anyone who has studied nature knows that nature can be both beautiful and cruel. You can have hope in luck, but you know that is a total waste of time. And by the way, that is where Nietzsche is right. Nietzsche said that it is a rainbow, a delusion, to have hope in luck. No, it is only the hope that we have in Christ that gives us hope. And what are the hopes of Christ? That Jesus is real. That he came into the world in Bethlehem. It is a truth that heaven is a real place. That Jesus created a way to heaven on the cross. And most important, my friends, it is a truth that the story ends well. I'll close with this. Many years ago, there was a film that was used as evangelism tools throughout the world, but nowhere more effectively than the continent of Africa. Now, you may know that in Africa, there are over 2,000 native languages spoken. So the ability to translate this film into 2,000 native languages was absolutely impossible. But the beauty of this film was that it didn't actually have any words. All it had was images of Christ and music. And so it begins with a little baby in a manger. And so as it is played in these little tiny tribal villages in rural Africa, as people gather in the middle of these huts and they put up a 16 millimeter projector screen and they show this, People are seeing these images for the first time. <clears throat> now, of course, the images of Christ are beautiful until it comes to the end, when Jesus is nailed upon the cross. And then in at least one of these villages, it is said that people began to be so upset and how agitated and, and how anxious they became when they saw Jesus going on the cross. But the story also goes that in one of these villages, a little boy ran to the front and he said to all of them, do not worry, do not be afraid. And they all said, why? He said, because I have seen this movie before. And he said, the story ends well. My friends, the story ends well. And that is why if every day we say the word nevertheless, we have the hope of Christ that the story ends well. God, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for blessing each person here today. We pray that we would get to the key of our lives, the nevertheless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.